Chapter 18, Humility. An Easter ceremony will always be the highlight of my memories of Norilsk. Unfortunately, it was also the cause of my leaving. The preceding Lent had seen some of the busiest weeks I've ever spent as a priest. Fathers Victor and Neron had left Norilsk, and I was alone, yet our congregation was bigger than ever. All during Lent I spent my free time hearing confessions and baptizing. On Palm Sunday I said three masses and preached at each of them, telling the people that the full Holy Week services would be held. After the masses on Palm Sunday, the people crowded around to make arrangements for the traditional blessing of the Easter food. Because I was alone and there was so much to do, I formed a committee of men to organize this blessing of the Easter baskets. In a special notebook, we sketched out a map of the city of Norilsk, picked out certain assembly points, and set specific times so that anyone who couldn't make it to my little bullock could meet me there for the blessing of the food. When all the arrangements were more or less completed, I figured I would have time to begin at 5 p.m. on Friday, work around the clock, and hope to finish in time for the Easter Mass. All day Friday, I heard a tremendous number of Easter confessions, as I had every night that week after work. On Friday evening, after the Good Friday services, I set out to begin my tour of the city. Every place I went, there were people waiting, even in the middle of the night or the long, cold hours of early morning. I got back to my bullock Saturday morning in time for services at 6 a.m. It was jammed with people, many of whom had been there overnight in order to get a place before the altar for this long Easter vigil service. Many of them, too, stayed in the chapel after the Saturday services until it was time for the Easter midnight mass with nothing to eat all day so they could be close to the altar. After the services, I started making the rounds again, doubling back to my bullock every few hours to bless the baskets of food that filled my little room from wall to wall, a new batch every time. By 11.30 p.m. Saturday, I was back home, but I could hardly get near the bullock. Even the corridors in the vestibule were jammed. Crowds of people were swarming around outside in the midnight cold. There was barely room to move anywhere, but by 12 o'clock I was vested. I couldn't lift my arms because of the crowds, so someone had to pull the vestments over my head and ready for Mass. The altar was covered with flowers and candles. We even had a choir. As I began the solemn intonation of the Easter Mass, the chapel seemed to explode with sound. An Easter Mass is a joyous one to begin with, but the enthusiasm of the people that night I shall never forget. Tired as I was after more than 48 hours without sleep, hurrying from place to place, I felt suddenly elated and swept along. I forgot about everything but the Mass and the joy of Easter. The crowds were so great it was impossible to distribute communion because no one could move. Communion had to be distributed after Mass. The services ended at 3 a.m., but at 9 o'clock the next morning I was still distributing communion to a constant stream of people. I could hear the crowds outside, going home through the Easter dawn, shouting the traditional Easter greeting, Christos Voskres, Christ is risen, and the joyous answer, Foistenu Voskres, indeed he is risen. After it was finally all over, I came back to my room alone and sat down at the little table in my bullock, completely exhausted. Yet I was deeply satisfied. I knew a joy that day I have rarely known. I felt that at last, in God's own good providence, I was beginning to live my dream of serving his flock in Russia. And all this was the thought that kept flashing through my mind. All this took place in Russia, in Norilsk. Within the week, though, I was summoned from work to the office of the KGB. The agent in charge wasted no time. He greeted me abruptly with the statement, Vladimir Martinovich, your missionary work here in Norilsk is not needed. Do you understand? He told me sternly to get a ticket on the next available flight to Krasnoyarsk and to report to the KGB there. If you attempt to come back here, you will be arrested and put into prison. I'm in charge here, and those are orders. I just looked at him and said nothing. After a long pause, he said coldly, you may leave. As I turned to leave, however, he added, when you get your ticket, I will personally escort you to the airport. The flight from Norilsk to Krasnoyarsk is a long one, possibly as much as four hours. I had never flown before, and I was tense and scared as the plane took off. I leaned back hard in the seat and shut my eyes, trying not to move a muscle. I could feel the drumming of the motors in my head until my ears popped, but I was even more conscious of an uneasiness at the base of my stomach, once I got used to it, I sat there thinking of the people I was leaving behind, saddened by the thought that I could do nothing for them any longer but commend them to God. I tried hard to resist the thoughts of anger that had been burning within me since my visit to KGB headquarters, 
and I still felt humiliated by the way they could order me around even though I was supposed to be a free man. I consoled myself as always with the thought that God knew what he was doing. I kept repeating, Thy will be done, but it was hard to understand. After a while, as I prayed, the thought came to me that doing the will of the Father is not always an easy task. The words of our Lord I had been repeating to myself were uttered in the agony of the garden. They were Christ's own prayer just before the hours of his greatest trials and humiliations. We often use them as an example of obedience, but they are in fact the most perfect illustration of the virtue of humility. For humility, after all, is based on a very simple recognition of a fundamental truth, the true relationship between God and men. Humility is truth is a spiritual adage that sums it up well, for humility is nothing more or less than knowing our place before God. Christ's whole life from birth to death was a perfect act of humility that flowed from his total submission to the will of the Father. It reached its crest on the cross, where he died humiliated and deprived of everything. Learn of me, he said to his disciples, for I am meek and humble of heart. Even after a great deal of experience in the spiritual life, though, most of us are seldom humble when humiliated. We constantly need to remind ourselves of the humble Christ, the Christ who did always the will of the Father, if we are ever to learn. It is only natural to resent humiliation. We recoil from humiliating experiences because they are an affront to the dignity of our persons, which is another way of saying that our pride is hurt. That is the key to the problem, and it is then that we do well to recall who we really are and who God is. If we see nothing beyond the experience except the hurt and the unpleasantness, it can only be because we have lost sight, for the moment at least, of God's will and of his providence. For humiliations arise out of the circumstances, situations, and people that God presents to us each day, and all these are but a manifestation of his providence. So we must learn to discern in such things, even in the humiliations, occasions for a deeper conformity to the will of God. Christ had to suffer opposition and contradiction and, yes, humiliation in doing his Father's will. Yet he was constantly intent on forgetting self entirely and glorifying the Father by his actions. If we are truly to imitate Christ in our lives, we must learn to do the same. We must constantly return to the catechism truth we learned as children, that God made us to love, reverence, and serve him in this life and so to be happy with him in the next. We are not saved by doing our own will, but the will of the Father. We do that not by interpreting it or reducing it to mean what we would like it to mean, but by accepting it in its fullness, as made manifest to us by the situations and circumstances and persons his providence sends us. It is so simple, and yet so difficult. Each day and every minute of every day is given to us by God with that in mind. We, for our part, can accept and offer back to God every prayer, work, and suffering of the day, no matter how insignificant or unspectacular they may seem to us. Yet it is precisely because our daily circumstances often seem so insignificant and unspectacular that we fail so often in this regard. It is the seeming smallness of our daily lives and the constancy of things that cause our attention and our good intentions to wander away from the realization that these things, too, are signs of God's will. Between God and the individual soul, however, there are no insignificant moments. This is the mystery of divine providence. We see examples of this in lives around us every day. Young people planning to get married, choosing a profession, or answering a vocation to the priesthood or religious life, feel an enthusiasm and an interior joy they never knew before. Then, as the years go by, difficulties increase, and there is a constant need for more sacrifice and a renewal of spirit in the initial promise or vow taken. And then it is that the test of one's humility, the realization of one's place before God, really begins. Then it is that the difficulties of a man's calling begin to become a burden. My yoke is sweet and my burden light, said Christ, but the burdens of life, the sacrifices and self-denials, the humiliations, can be so only if we see in them the express will of God. Can there be anything more consoling than to look at a burden or a humiliation, not just as it is in itself, but as the will of God entrusted to you at that moment? Viewed in that way, no matter how heavy or trying the burden or the difficulty, I am able to carry it in a spirit that indeed can make it light, for the realization that it comes from God and His will for me carries with it a feeling of enthusiasm, of accomplishment, of importance that brings joy and consolation to the heart. 
But unfortunately, those who have lost a true sense of humility, that constant realization of the relationship between each individual and God, have also lost thereby the ability to look upon their burdens in this way. They see instead only the burden, the difficulties, the humiliation, and they become depressed. They begin to pity themselves, to question things in their married lives or in their vocations that they valued highly before. Sacrifice, work, and dedication seem meaningless. Charity, patience, and love become merely empty words. They begin to question now even the wisdom or the validity of their initial decision to look for freedom in some way out. Perhaps they justify it with the data of science or psychology or arguments about changing times in a changing world. But ultimately, what they are trying to explain is the radical change in themselves that has brought them to the point of interior crisis in a vocation they once embraced with so much joy and enthusiasm. How can all of this happen so suddenly, seemingly in so short a period of time? The answer lies in a loss of the virtue of humility, a loss of the vision of life as significant in God's sight, a loss of the vision that sees all things as coming from the hand of God, once this vision is lost, then the self very subtly begins to assume greater importance and God's will begins to grow less and less important. It's not our failings or faults or sins of themselves that bring this about. It is a lack of humility. No matter how badly the humble man fails, he will reckon his accounts with God and start over again, for his humility tells him of his total dependence on God. In this lies the difference between the truly humble person and the one who lacks humility. The former sees the blame in himself for the disorders of his life, for his failures and his faults, and he strives to recapture again a sense of dedication to God's will. The latter, far from blaming himself for any faults or failings, tries to justify his actions in some way or other, and persists in doing exactly those things that are slowly alienating him from God and his vocation. Even the feelings of remorse that afflict him are not seen as a grace from God to lead him back, but are interpreted instead as signs that his original decision to follow this or that vocation must somehow have been a mistake. So I sat on the plane heading for Krasnoyarsk asking myself why I should suddenly feel so resentful at having to leave my parish in Norilsk. Was it because I felt humiliated at the way I had been ordered to leave by the KGB? After all these years of trying to see God's will and the twists and turns my life had taken in spite of my own dreams and intentions, sometimes in direct contrast to what I had intended or devised, after all the years of coming gradually to see God's hand and His providence in the strange and often bitter events I had experienced, why should I now hesitate to imagine or understand that this move, too, was from God? My ways are not your ways, says the Lord, and my thoughts are not your thoughts, for as far as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways above your ways. How many times had I finally come to understand this in reflecting on my own experiences? How many times had I determined to try to see always his will in all things? And would I now hesitate to accept this abrupt end to my apostolate in Norilsk because it made no sense to my human wisdom? Was it really concern for the courageous Christians I was leaving behind that saddened me? Or was it personal disappointment in having to end my first really rewarding experience as a priest just when things seemed to be going so well? Could I imagine, was I afraid, that God had no other way to take care of his people? So I will have him wait until I come, our Lord said to Peter, follow thou me. Christ had called Peter aside, but Peter was concerned about John. And now Christ, through the KGB, was calling me from Norilsk. Why should I doubt that he would provide somehow for those I was leaving behind, even as he had provided for them before I came? My first concern, instead, should be to follow wherever he led, to see his will always in the events of my life and follow it faithfully, without question or hesitation. Yes, I was disappointed. No, I didn't have the answers to all the questions that plagued me, nor could I sort out completely the thoughts that filled my mind as the plane flew closer to Krasnoyarsk. But one thing I knew. I had long ago determined to strive to see always his will in all things. I had promised to abandon myself completely to his providence. This was a new day, perhaps a new chapter in my role of spreading the kingdom, and my job was to accept without question the situations and circumstances of this day without looking back. This was no time, after all I had learned and come to understand of the mysterious ways of his providence, to begin rejecting the workings of his grace and his will. My task this day, as always, was to yield without hesitation and without questioning the wisdom of his will, 
to accept it in all reverence without trying to make it conform to my will or understand it fully with my limited human wisdom, to abandon myself once again in complete trust and confidence to the mysterious workings of his grace and his wisdom. My life, like Christ's, if my priesthood meant anything, was to do always the will of the Father. It was humility I needed, the grace to realize my position before God, not just in times when things were going well as they had been in Norilsk, but more so in times of doubt and disappointment, like today, when things were not going the way I would have planned them or wished them. That's what humility means, learning to accept disappointments and even defeat as God sent learning to persevere and carry on with peace of heart and confidence in God, secure in the knowledge that something worthwhile is being accomplished precisely because God's will is at work in our life and we are doing our best to accept and follow it. For it is not man or what he does that counts most in the plans of divine providence, but rather that a man accepts in confidence and fulfills to the best of his ability each day what God has chosen for him. For the foolish things of this world God chooses to confound the wise, says St. Paul, and the weak things of this world God chooses to confound the strong. That God could use someone like myself, stubborn and sometimes stupid and full of failings, was the one thing I had learned through trial and error, through suffering and defeat, and now was no time to start backsliding. True humility consists of learning to recognize this relationship always, we must remind ourselves over and over again of the fact, for it is all too easy for proud human nature suddenly to think that this or that accomplishment is due to the efforts we made and the work we have done. And just as surely as we begin to fail in humility, we begin to lose sight of God and His grace, to exclude Him to some extent from our lives. Be thankful then, I thought to myself, that God in His loving care sends humiliations your way. Be thankful for the KGB, lest you begin to think that Easter in Norilsk was somehow your doing. It was God who planted the seed in the hearts of those people, fathers Victor and Neron who watered it, and it was only because God and his providence put you there at that time that you enjoyed the harvest and the consolation of those days. Be consoled, you idiot, I said to myself, but don't be fooled. It was the same God who arranged for that joy in order to strengthen and console you and who has now arranged your abrupt and humiliating departure from the scene to remind you once more that all things on this earth are governed by His providence and not man's efforts. That was yesterday, and today is today. You haven't done anything yet in the Soviet Union except by His grace and His will. Every time you tried to do something on your own to plan ahead, to work out answers beforehand, you made a miserable mess of your efforts and had to learn all over again to look for God's will in the situations and circumstances. Isn't it about time you learned? Isn't it time you learned to be meek and humble of heart, to give up your own will and strive to conform to God's, to seek first the kingdom of God and His justice, and not worry about where this plane is taking you, or what you will meet there, or what you are leaving behind? 